So uh, thank you all for actually coming. Uh, so my talk here is why developers choose the OpenSUSE ecosystem. And of course, why rocking with the chameleon is awesome. So to kind of get started a little bit, just to introduce myself, my name is Neil Gompa. I'm an open source advocate, as I would I call myself. I'm a contributor and package maintainer in a number of Linux distributions, Fedora, Magia, OpenSUSE, of course. And uh, I contribute to a lot of upstream projects related to systems and software management, like RPM, DNF, Zipper, Kiwi, OBS, uh, Spacewalk, UUni. Um, and for my professional work, I'm a DevOps engineer at Datto Incorporated. And uh, for a big chunk of my job, I'm a developer and a maintainer of the package build and release pipeline, which includes having, maintaining my own open build service instance. And small note here, it's interconnected with the it opens as a build service, so and a lot of the stuff that I work on for my build service, it goes up into the it goes up to OpenSUSE. So let's start with the beginning of OpenSUSE, like where it all begins and it starts. So just after Novell had acquired SUSE AG, they there was they created the OpenSUSE project, you know, back in 2005. Back then there was just uh, only a couple of Linux distributions that were like from the corporate to become the community. Fedora had just happened a couple of years before. Um, Arch and Gen 2 as community uh, distributions had just been founded a little bit before even that. Debian was in the middle of its crisis at the time of governance, or it just completed dealing with its crisis of governance. I always forget there. But the creation of the OpenSUSE project, the goal from that, from the very beginning, was to bring a high quality platform for people to work and play you know to everyone and you know when it it was so successful within its first year they renamed the SUSE Linux professional to open SUSE as well you know just made it a complete entity the open SUSE project with the open SUSE Linux distribution but it's much more than that now it does so much uh, it's a hub of communities with all kinds of stuff, from Yast and LibUI to the Open Build Service, OBS and Kiwi, the Open QA, UUni, and OpenSUSE Cubic as one of the newest additions, and much more all over the place. You know, and one of these is kind of uh, close to me in many ways with LibUI. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with Yast, the you know awesome configuration tooling that's part of the SUSE Linux distribution family. LibUI was a general purpose library split out of the uh, YAST project. It's a UI toolkit that supports a number of front end bindings, GTK3, Qt5, as well as uh, end curses for the text environments. And it was, it's, it's still very unique among, among all of those out there. And because of that, it was adopted by the Magia project for the successor to the Magia control center or the Mandriva control center for the new Mana tools. Uh, and that was even a little bit before my time as a Magia contributor. And so they, they've, been they've been using it and they developed their own extensions on top of it, the LibUI MGA extensions, which offer some extra widgets and things that you can use across the three uh, front ends, GTK, Qt, and N curses. Um, and there's been a number of tools for that it kind of operates in a similar vein to Yast, just a lot simpler and smaller focused. But also, Magia developed a tool called DNF Dragora, which is a front end for the DNF package manager to offer uh, uh, for package management, software management, stuff like that. And it was and it uses it as well. And they adopted it in even Fedora. So Fedora for if you're not using the Fedora workstation, so all the desktop spins. Um, to the best of my knowledge, all of them ship with DNF Dragora as the package manager. So there's a little piece of SUSE technology that is being used even more so than what they were using uh, for uh, sh having a good de desktop experience for managing your software. And the GTK front end is not even ma maintained primarily by SUSE anymore. It is maintained by Fedoras and Fedorans and Magians. So it's a community managed uh, piece of the LibUI toolkit. Uh, whereas Qt and N curses are managed by SUSE and used by Yast. So 
But of course, it goes more, more beyond that. There's also the open build service, which is literally the staple of how the OpenSUSE community managed to be so successful and supporting a wide variety of software and all over the place. It's a, it's a generic, powerful build system that makes it easy to make reproducible software and uh, reproducibly built software. And it builds for a wide range of Linux distributions from obviously the SUSE distributions to the Red Hat family, uh, Debian and Ubuntu, and even, shockingly, Arch Linux and, all, and much more. And it supports building images as well, and I'll get to that in a moment. And it's used by a wide number of communities. Uh, Video Land, Dell, Mare, Tizen, like those. Most recently, the Wine Project actually switched to using OBS for building all of their packages. They used to do it on their own thing with, I think, some kind of weird build bot based stuff. But they just, they just switched over, I think, last December to using the official Wine uh, OBS project space that's used to feed the official OpenSUSE packages. So the OpenSUSE maintainer contributed that effort and made it so that they could use uh, the OpenSUSE build service for supplying official Wine packages. So that's great as well. And it's used by many ISVs internally, including even me. Like, so as I mentioned earlier, at Data, we use the open build service for building all of our software. Um, I did a little bit of contributions here and there to the open build service project to, to help support what we, what we do. And we were even running, in the very beginning, we were running pre-alphas. Uh, of the OBS 2.7 release as we were kind of iterating through to get all the, get what we needed out the door. Um, of course, now we run the latest stable and whatnot, but we currently release um, using our stuff, with, with using our OBS instance, we're releasing to somewhere close to 30 different distribution releases in tandem for every single one of our, uh, every single one of the uh, releases of our Linux backup agent, which is our primary external product that we build with it. And, and it's, it's amazing. Like at one point in time, we built almost 40 distribution releases. We've cut it down some as the number of distributions have gone end of life, but it just shows how powerful and flexible it is. And if you're interested in hearing more about how I did that and some of the neat tricks I pulled off to make that uh, more simple than you would think, uh, you can talk to me afterwards and I can kind of show you some of that. Um, but of course, it's not just building packages that matter. You should also, you need to, anyone who's really working with making enterprise software will probably want to deliver that in a form that everything's all put together and everything's all configured um, in an appliance with an image or an installer script or something like that. And Kiwi is a, great, is a good generic system image builder that can do all this. And because of its integration within the open build service, it can do, it, your package builds can trigger image builds, so you'll always have fresh images based on the content that you rely on for your images, and that's great for trying to release stuff rapidly. Um, and it supports pretty much any RPM or Debian-based distribution that is supported by OBS itself. Uh, and it's packaged and available in OpenSUSE, Sli, and even in Fedora. Um, yours truly packages and maintains Kiwi in Fedora so that he can actually do more image builds all the time, no matter where he's on. But uh, yeah, it's a great tool. I'm actually an active contributor to it myself. Uh, I help fix up most of the non-SUSE distribution support, and I'm actively testing and working with, with, the, with the SUSE developers on it as well. And it's, they're great, they're very friendly. It's just awesome. Um, but after you've built your images, you of course need to be able to test them. And this is, you know, and there's not a lot of great, there's not a lot of tools out there, but one stands out for this kind of stuff, OpenQA, which um, if any of you are familiar with how OpenSUSE is released for Tumbleweed, OpenQA is the cornerstone of making successful releases of OpenSUSE Tumbleweed. Every snapshot, which is an instance of the collection of packages that they want to put out to the public for people to use, uh, runs through a battery of tests in OpenQA before they can be validated for release. And OpenQA is actually really special. It is designed to behave like a user. So like it'll simulate prob uh, the proper human computer interaction, like moving a mouse, typing keys at the, uh, at the rate of a person, things like that. So it would do actions as if a human would, which means that you can test all kinds of interesting behaviors, like even hovers and stuff like that. Those actions are really hard to test in most conventional uh, front-end testing things, but OpenQA can pull it off. And it's really, really great at that. And 
And it's not just OpenSUSE that uses it, Fedora uses it too. And, they've, and in the Fedora community, they've contributed the code for supporting another message broker, an event-driven system called FedMessage, which is a zero MQ based um, messaging and event system. And they've also done the containerization for, for OpenQA. So thanks to what Fedora has done, OpenQA can be deployed fully in containers and can actually be used in that way to scale out and support all kinds of interesting, uh, interesting uh, deployment schemes. And it's, it supports both working with virtual machines as well as uh, physical systems through IPMI. So it's, it's pretty powerful and it's great. And you can even see a little screenshot here of like this is the Fedora OpenQA instance. It's not quite as impressive as the OpenSUSE one, which has I think three times as many tests. But, it, it, but I wanted to show that like, it's, it's everyone who, who wants to use it. And I know of other distributions and other projects that are starting to take a look at using OpenQA and integrating it as part of supporting their stuff. And it's, it's definitely a best-in-class solution, in my view. And you know, we're going to swing a little bit over to the corporate side of things. You know, most people don't really have to, most people have only a few systems, but you know, when it comes to handling large numbers of systems, whether it be in the cloud or you know, in, a, in a data farm, or even in your apartment where you're starting your small business, um, you, know, you need to manage all those systems. And uh, the, the UUNI project, which is a systems, uh, provides a systems management platform, it is forked from another project, Spacewalk, but it, it provides a lot of extra functionality. It's got a modernized backend and UI. It integrates a salt master into it, so you can have modern configuration management into there. It integrates image creation using Kiwi, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and it's a friendly fork. So mo sometimes when forks like this happen, it's a, it's a complete divide of the communities. But the spacewalk and your uni communities still talk to each other. They're still working with each other. And they're still helping each other. So wherever it makes sense and wherever it's possible, the two communities try to collaborate and bring things together whenever it's possible. And of course, it is the basis for the SUSE Manager product. And yeah, so it, it's very cool. And I've been personally, I, I was personally a contributor to the Spacewalk project. Some of my stuff that went into there has been pulled into UUni. And I'm also starting to actively work in the UUni community and the UUni project as well for all kinds of interesting things. It's, it's something that uh, if, if this is the kind of space you're kind of interested in or something that you use quite often, take a look. And they lo the developers are friendly. They'd love to hear from you. And they, and they want your support. It's a fresh project. It's got fresh eyes. Let, uh, it, it's great. So what kind of delta would you have with the SUSE manager? So I, don't, I can't fully qualify that answer because I am not part of the SUSE manager team or an employee of SUSE. But my best guess is that uh, with the 4.0 beta, none because it should be based directly on the UUni stuff. The SUSE Manager 3 product, um, my understanding is that some of the salt functionality isn't quite there. Uh, the image, in, image building integration functionality is not complete. Um, some of that stuff. Uh, so with the 4.0 release, you should see virtually no delta from the UUni one. And going forward, they should keep a tight loop between the SUSE Manager downstream and the UUni upstream. So. But now we got to the really exciting stuff. The, the newest uh, member of the, uh, one of the newest members of the OpenSUSE distribution family is OpenSUSE Cubic. But it's not just a, a, a Linux distribution, it is also a Kubernetes distribution. So the first open source certified Kubernetes platform with Cryo. And it's built on top of the OpenSUSE MicroOS, which is an awesome, tiny operating system platform that offers an immutable software stack, an operating system stack, and transactional updates that leverage the ButterFS file system and very special features in it to be able to uh, give you consistent, atomic, and reliable um, uh, server platform for running uh, Kubernetes or anything else. It, MicroOS is a more general purpose under, system underpinning the, the uh, cubic system. 
And it, of course, represents the future of container service platforms, including the SUSE Container as a Service platform. Personally, I find this to be the, one of the most exciting things that has happened within the OpenSUSE community because they're really, they're pushing the bar on, ta on what you can do to make a purpose-built platform that can scale out well and be reproducible and reliable and understandable. Like they've done a good job making it so that you can figure out what is going on on these systems. Like most, most alternatives have all kinds of kooky behaviors and crazy things that just make it difficult for you to be able to leverage it. That's not the case in here. But you know, those are those are the the members of that's the members of the OpenSUSE project. But let's talk a little bit more about the relationship and, between SUSE and OpenSUSE. So, from a superficial level, you know, people think that the extent of OpenSUSE and SUSE's relationship is that, you know, OpenSUSE is just the basis for for SLES, for SLED, for SLES SAP, and so on, like the various SLE products. Um, Yes, that, that part is still true. It is still the basis for all of those enterprise products that a lot of you rely on. But it's a lot more than that. You know, it's SUSE and OpenSUSE, the two communities work together. Yes, there is this basis there. There's a, and the upstream stuff, all the cool stuff happens first in OpenSUSE. And it feeds into the SUSE um, innovation pipeline, where they start figuring out all this cool stuff, figuring out how to stabilize it, how to leverage it, and how to product, I can't, that's not a word, but make it into a product that, uh, that, that you can rely on for your business and all of those things. And that stuff fee is then you know, graciously fed back into the OpenSUSE community in the form of OpenSUSE Leap and a number of the other enhancements that they do. The engineers work on the core system stack, the kernel, they're very responsive, very helpful, and just overwhelmingly a strong member and a part of the community. And from this, you can see the mutual collaboration between the upstream communities and the SUSE engineering and the SUSE uh, corporate you know, folks all together. It's, it's fantastic. And so this is, goes to why would I choose OpenSUSE? And I, as a developer, as a user, you know, and so on. I do this because the OpenSUSE motto is those who do decide. Um, if any of you have seen Richard's talks in the past, he's talked about this quite a fair bit. Hopefully I can do him justice with, this, you know, with my, my take on it. You know, for me, the idea is that the open source works best when the contributors and the volunteers that are working together on this stuff are able to be empowered to make the decisions that are relevant to those contributions, to the work that they're doing. And because of that, they can do self, they can come together, make amazing things, put it, to, put it out for the world to use. And you know, just, and then other people come in and it just, it feeds into this interesting virtuous cycle uh, where people just come together and self-organize and make great things and share them with everyone else. And it can be used for all kinds of things, from you know little fun things to like working on a, doing your presentation on a Raspberry Pi, to something as amazing as having a large Ceph cluster running on ARCH64 servers at one tenth the power consumption of the comparable Intel x86 systems. I'm making these numbers up, but you know the, you you kind of get the point. Um, but you know, there's a really important example that I think illustrates how this has worked so well for OpenSUSE. And shockingly, you know, this is something that if if you're familiar with the what's been going on in uh, in Debian. So show of hands first, how many of you are like either using Debian or involved in Debian as a project or whatnot? No? Ah, one little guy over here. So hopefully you won't feel bad when I mention this, but you know. <laughs> they have their points, but uh, you know, in Debian, there was you know, somewhat surprisingly a vicious, a vicious argument over 
you know, the swapping over from the legacy system five in it that had been around for 20 plus years to using uh, system D, you know, and there was bickering and hurt feelings everywhere and eventually a fork out of it um, and so on. In OpenSUSE, that's not what happened. Surprise, surprise, surprise. When people start, when they do it of their own volition and make the proposals and all of these things together, it turns out to go a lot better. And, uh, you know, OpenSUSE was, I think, the third major distribution to ship it. So after Fedora and Arch, OpenSUSE came right after to ship it as the default. And it, the changes were made entirely by volunteers. Nobody really prompted them from SUSE or anywhere else. Um, in fact, I think some of the enthusiasm in there, like one of the early developers of Systemd after Leonard himself uh, was a SUSE employee. And so like they were working together, just out of enthusiasm, they were working together on making it a better project. And the changes were made by volunteers who were just enthusiastic about the project, and there was really no, no major strife at all, and it was, it was great. So if you want to be working in this, then it's not that hard to yourself. It's just keep it simple. The, if you make your chunks smaller and manageable and easier for people to look at them, it's much easier. And being clear about how, you know, what the purpose of these changes are, like, especially if, you know, because OpenSUSE is a global community, and while the community by default, you know, I, speaks, in, uh, speaks sort of in English, not everyone's a native speaker. So being very clear and upfront about how you're going, it works, it actually seems to work the best across the mix of cultures and the mix of people and so on. And it, when you do it that way, uh, it'll just, it usually will be fine. Like, and, but it's important to remember that it is a global community. So you gotta remember your time zones, day of week, time of day, holidays, and so on. And OpenSUSE is a community that is actually mostly made up of volunteers. SUSE is not the largest contingent of people working on it. And so you have to be mindful of the fact that most of the people are not necessarily working during working hours. So if you don't see, hear responses like during your business day, quite likely it's because they're working and they won't get to it until afterwards. Or you know, if you're working with somebody who is working on SUSE as part of their job, or on OpenSUSE as part of their job, then you have to remember the opposite. Like it, it, it depends on the person, it depends on the type of team and the types of things like that. But plan for the extra effort to keep track of who you're working with and to be responsive and to be there for when they have concerns. And just as long as you keep that flow of communication together, it works great. It's also important to remember there's no such thing as an us versus them. It's all about everyone working together. And we are, we are all trying to make a better Linux platform for everyone to work and play and do whatever they need. Um, and, don't, and not everyone will get along every time or agree on everything together. It's not a kumbaya kind of thing. There will be disagreements, but don't take them personally. Even if they're a little bit on the strong side, it, it might just be that you know, there's just got to be some further ironing out, and that's fine. Um, don't be disappointed in that and be realistic that you're in your expectations of how things will go. It's not like anybody can command anybody to get anything done like right away and whatnot. It'll, it'll generally happen uh, as soon as everyone can, as soon as people can get to it and as soon as the stuff is uh, appropriately reviewed and whatnot. So, you know, maybe it'll take a week or two for something that maybe in your corporate environment would take a day. People have to go through it and they probably can't process everything quite as quickly because they've got a lot to do. There's other things going on, life, you know, so on. And yeah, yeah, it's, it depends on where you engage. But like, I, the, the, yes, this applies to OpenSUSE, but this also could apply to any other open source project. These are good general advice. Uh, uh, within the OpenSUSE community, it is mostly volunteers. But like, for example, the UUni community at this point is mostly employees working for SUSE. And so you have to keep that in mind when you're trying to figure out how to communicate with them because many of them will not be around during weekends or nights because they're not working. And so it, it all depends, right? So the open build service team is another example of where if you're trying to get in touch with the main developers, you'll probably want to figure out what their business hours are and whether the day that you're talking to them on is a holiday or not in Germany, which 
actually sometimes is complicated. But uh, <laughs> but hey, hey, I'm an American, so I, I and I, interfacing with Germans means I do have to keep that in mind, and it gets tricky depending on which part of Germany they're actually living in. So, but it's also like getting back to this. It's important to please don't fork active projects unless there's a like. I did mention UUni before, and that is technically a fork of an active project, but there, there is almost no reason to do it, and unless there's really irreconcilable differences, which usually that's not the case, it, most of the time you can just work with each other and figure it out. And most people are happy to be able to figure out how to bring people together and make their community bigger and stronger for it. So. Uh, when you're working on your stuff, you may think it's faster to just fork it and make it your own thing and like keep going on that. Yes, it takes more effort. Sometimes it takes more work. But it's much more rewarding and much better for you uh, and the community if you, uh, when you make those changes, you aim to contribute them back and make it part of the main project and be a member of that project. But, but your business success alone is not a good enough reason for other people to help you. For the best success, you want to make the reason something the community would care about for getting to care about or get behind. Something that's more valuable to other people is much more likely to get done quickly because they don't work for you. You work with them. And that's a very important distinction. But that being said, if you do have business intentions, and if there are re business reasons for this, people usually are okay with knowing that that is a thing. So be straight, be straight with them. Uh, and if there are business intentions, state them. But don't demand that your business reasons are the reasons that it should get done. That is a terrible reason. And I promise you it'll make everyone very, very upset with you. And so it's, it's not a great idea to do it that way. But otherwise, you know, business reasons are fine. Just don't try to be a bully while doing it. So, OpenSUSE, of course, is a project with a bias for action. So, when in doubt, just do it anyway. We'll see what happens. And the worst that can happen is that you broke everything. So we'll just hit the reset button and pull it all back. It's fine. Who, it, it, it's really fine. This is why we have tools like OpenQA. We have OBS to you know, pull all these things and stage them and test them and integrate them. That's what that's all for. But if you need help figuring out how to do the thing, Share your idea with the project. Share about what your goals are. What you, what do you hope to see? And listen to what everyone else has to say. And then respond and decide how to work based on that. Heck, somebody else might find your idea interesting and come and help you with it. That certainly happened with me a couple of times. You know, just you know, as an example of something like this that, that happened a little while ago. Um, I was working on refactoring some pretty low-level stuff within the RPM package itself. Uh, trying to make some of the configuration stuff a little simpler and more cleanly split out so that upgrading RPM and getting new features at that part would be easier in, within OpenSUSE because it's been pretty painful historically. Uh, and a couple of people just were also interested and came and helped me with it. And that was great. I mean, I, I kind of had an idea of how to proceed, but like they helped me figure out how to, you know, how to get moving for, forward. And, of course, it's important to know how to get in touch with people in OpenSUSE. So here are the main like, mailing lists and the, and the IRC channels. Most of the communication tends to happen on the mailing lists. There are a number, of course, of IRC channels where you can get in touch with people, uh, both SUSE people and non-SUSE people alike. I mean, I'm in both project and factory, I think. And I am subscribed to way more mailing lists than I can remember. But yeah, so there, if you want to, if you want to get in touch with them, with anyone needing some help or introducing a new thing, there you go. Um, and of course, to recap, those who do decide. OpenSUSE is a hacker-centric community. It's self-organizing, self-motivating, and it's huge. It's a large, large group of people across the world who just enjoy making one of the best Linux platforms there are, and. Making the improvements, it's just a submit request away on the build service. 
or just a pull request away if it's a code change in, in, in GitHub. Um, it's an, they've got an excellent infrastructure for doing all kinds of crazy things. All you have to do is want to do it. And it's, friend, it's a friendly community. It's amazing. So what are you waiting for? You know, you're all set. Go do something amazing. And you know, make everyone uncomfortable, all the electrons uncomfortable with all the stuff that you're doing. And join us in OpenSUSE. So, that's it. Any questions?